Well, welcome everyone to just a very, very important conversation that we have, a roundtable discussion on racial injustice in the United States. And I am so honored to have in our uh, our panel today, friends, uh, brothers and sisters who I just love dearly that we've been together. And well, you know what, let me just actually introduce some of these guys and then share, give a little uh, insight into what we're talk about today. Our host today will be Roy Patterson. Roy is the Director of Community Impact for Moody Bible Institute and also radio host for Moody Radio. We have Re Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil, mm -hmm. author, speaker, professor, thought leader, and also pastor over at the Quest Church in Seattle. We have Ms. Trillia Newbell, acquisitions, acquisitions editor at Moody Publishers, author as well as speaker and owner of SJ Boutique. We have Pastor Ephraim Smith. We've been seeing Ephraim in a lot of different places. He is the co-lead pastor of Bayside Church, Midtown, and City to City, North America, catalyst to the African American Networks. And my new friend, Mr. Shundran Thomas, president at Northern Trust Asset Management. And so today is a very, very key conversation. I'm going to actually drop off, allow Roy to really be able to moderate our hour-long conversation now, if you guys have questions for the panel and the audience, make sure you put it in the comments or at the same time, text me or email me, and then I will come back on in the last 15 minutes to really be able to ask those questions. So, Roy, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to disappear for a little bit. All right, Tommy, thank you so much. It's such a joy to have everybody with us today in this wonderful panel that we've got. Uh, it's going to be an amazing time. Let's start with just a word of prayer. Dear God, we love you. We thank you. Use this time for your glory and honor. We commit this time to you. Don't let it just be words. Don't let it just be some kind of verbiage that really goes nowhere, but let it penetrate our hearts. We want to move forward. We want to reach higher. We want to dig deeper. Have your way in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I've got a couple of questions for you guys. And so uh, I'm gonna kick it off with Pastor E, Pastor Ephraim. And then I want you, uh, I want the rest of you guys to chime in as well. Uh, Pastor, when you hear the names, Eric, Trayvon, Ahmad, George and Brianna, what comes to mind? Pain, trauma. Hmm. I can remember where I was when each of those names and the videos associated with some of them came to light. Yeah. But George, um, that rings a louder bell for me because I grew up on the block where he cried out. I'm from Minneapolis, that corner of 38th and Chicago. I rode a big wheel on that block. I learned to ride a bike on that block. I remember when Cup Foods was O'Toole's drugstore and my grandmother would send me down with a list to Mr. O'Toole's to get eggs and milk and cheese. And then once a month, she'd send me down there with some money to pay on the account. And Mr. O'Toole would say, now you tell Miss Knight. I said, all right now. I never thought the place where I grew up would be the place where I would watch an African-American man cry out for his life mm. and receive no grace. Hmm. All right, Reverend Brenda, um, when, those, when you hear those names, what comes to your mind? I feel like a mother. Uh, I have two young adult children myself. And uh, I think about my son who uh, told me he was he was happy that during this uh, time of the coronavirus and him being furloughed from his job, that although he is needing to watch his finances, he's had the time to do some things that he hasn't done before. And he used to run track when he was in high school, so he's so pleased that he's running again. And he's get and that should not make a mama scared. He, mm -hmm. I should be able to say, that's great. You're jogging, but now something as human and as normal and as supposedly healthy as uh, going for a run, 
puts a bit of a concern in my heart. That's what's happening to us. There is a trauma that we're experiencing and feeling because what should be normal? Uh, we're being asked to wear a mask so that we won't get infected. But we're also afraid that if we wear a mask, people perceive us differently than other people are perceived. So there's a catch 22 that is a bit, uh, it's hard to know how to put into words what it does in the soul and the psyche of a human being where you feel as if you're damned if you do and mm. you're damned if you don't. Mm. All right, Chandra. Yeah, certainly. Um my my comments from the comments from my um, co-panelists resonate, but there's one word that really rings out to me, and it's injustice. And you know, it's interesting because I think of uh, the words of the prophet Jeremiah, and and they were echoed by Dr. King. And he talks about how he noticed right that you would see the good people so often suffering, and the mm. evil people so often prospering. And you talk about those names and. I, I think one of the sad realities for us is while you have the different emotions that we talk about, and again, the injustice comes to my mind, the reason it's such injustice is because you're not unfortunately surprised by it. Hmm. Um, I was talking to a friend and, and, and he mentioned that he to this day cannot watch the video, but he said, as soon as someone began to describe the events, he knew the end of the story. And, and and so that's one of the things, um, you know, that, that, that I just think about so much. And, and the fact that when you think about what happened to, to, to this most recent event, I mean, it's the ultimate injustice. But, but, but all of the individuals that we think of, right, um, having their lives cut short. So um, that, that's really what comes to my mind. Troy, please share with us. Well, I had the exact same word in my mind is injustice. I was thinking about how it's just a complete and total lack of um, concern for a human. It's, um, I was thinking about the, the police officer. He had his hands in his pocket. It was as if he was chilling on the guy's head. I mean, it was, it was, there was just such a relaxed, non-caring, it's, who does that? So, so it is, it is a chilling, reality that that uh, an injustice and so for me it's it's been chilling and talk about trauma i i have been um my my kids one of my daughters was um playing with a a one of her young white friends and they were talking ab about their fears and one of the young girls said something like, um, I'm afraid we're gonna have another civil war. And my daughter said, if we do, the other side will shoot my mom. Oh my. And then her friend said, well, I will take the bullet. Hmm. I get chills thinking about it. They shouldn't be thinking about that. A four, a, I think it was like a six year old, six or seven year old girl. The video went around on Twitter where she was marching and she was saying, no justice, no peace. And I just, my stomach sank. People, people were applauding her, but I thought, what a shame. Mm -hmm. What a shame. She should be enjoying her little life, playing games, doing anything but marching for justice. And so, so for me, it is a injustice, I think would be um, the word. <laughs> Uh, and then the trauma that I'm seeing played out among my um, brothers and sisters, and then the kids as they're trying to figure this out, it's it's devastating in a lot of ways. Mm. All right, Trillia, thank you. Let me say their names again. Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Brianna Taylor. Well, they've caused us this situation this world we're in right now has caused us to ask a lot of questions about race in America. Um, Reverend Brenda, I want you to start off. What's your working definition of racism? 
Yeah, I think as I as a professor, I've learned that the easier to say something, the more concise we can say it, the more we can hold it in. So prejudice plus plus power. It's the ability to have a prejudice that is then combined with the power to do something that inhibits people's ability to thrive. That combination of prejudice plus power is lethal. And I would say that that is ultimately what leads to what we experience as racism. Hmm. I like that definition. Any Anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah if I could just offer this, Roy, one of the things that, that's interesting to me, just as, as one, a student of history, is you think about the very concept of race. I mean, it's, it's something that as a construct only exists for the last 400 years. And it's so pervasive in now how we think about the characterization of people. It has no biological basis. Mm. Uh, think about it, um, mm. but think about how insidious um, even the thoughts around it. So, so I certainly um, uh, agree with, and I and, and I affirm uh, what Brenda said. <laughs> the thing that that I would just add to it is though, you know, there is racism, but then there are racist ideas. Uh, and the, per the pervasiveness of an idea that starts with an inception that that somehow underneath our skin, we're actually different, that somehow we're not all God's creation, that because we're a different color, there's some sort of hierarchy that that one race, this concept of race that was literally made up means that we can now discriminate and have prejudicial treatment one versus the other. Now, we can whatever our color have racist ideas. But to Brenda's point, now when you have power, mm. you can use that power, whether it's on an individual basis or it becomes more systemic. Um, but but I, I think that one of the things that we really have to think about is why do we in society even accept the very premise, um, the, the, the very start of the concept of race where, where it was in its inception Categorizing people and making a hierarchy. That that's one of the things that, that has always been perplexing to me. Hmm. Hey, I'm I'm gonna go with your question for a sec uh, for a second here. Why why is that? Why why have we set up this kind of construct to uh divide and to separate um anybody? Why why do you think that is? Any thoughts on that? I'll jump in just to start the conversation to say that philosophically, there was this whole notion of the great chain of being that somehow there was this kind of a, a, a a way of understanding philosophically from the Greeks. So this dichotomization to try to figure out what was spiritual, what was what was body, what was evolved. And so this notion of a hierarchy of being started with this notion that there were certain beings closer to God, angels. And then there were certain people who were born into the arist uh, aristocracy and they would therefore, and they were white and they were nobles. And then there would be commoners and then there would be be, you know, working people and then barbarians and then plants and animals. And when white people from Europe who had that philosophical belief system encountered different people from Africa, India, Asia, and other places around the world, they put people into that hierarchy to try to figure out who was whom and, and put people in this category of being barbaric, therefore not quite human. And then that was given a theology. Wherever it is a given the ability to show enough oppressed people, they have to put some kind of a God thing on it. So mm -hmm. when slavery was then instituted, that same philosophical belief system coupled with a theological notion that somehow there were people who were not quite made in the image of God and needed to, they were more like heathens and needed to be civilized, mm -hmm. that then justified the castration of people, the taking of land from people, the enslaving of people. And so that would be my, my quick summary of what I think happened. And even though it's not biologically true, it is definitely a reality that has shaped the whole of American society. Mm. All right, Pastor E, let, let me ask you this. You're in an article, uh, Christianity Today, and uh, you alluded to uh, what Dr. King said. We won't remember the sounds of our enemies, but we will uh, remember the silence of our friends. And you really, really were hammering over and over again that the uh, church needs to speak up. Why is that important? 
Uh, first of all, it's just totally not fair that I have to follow Dr. Salter McNeil after <laughs> you just said. So uh, this is like reversing the opening act with the mainline act, but I will do my best. So the reason, first and foremost, that the church cannot afford to be silent is because racism, the race structure, is a tremendous hindrance barrier to the Great Commission. How can we make disciples of all nations? How can we provide a sneak preview of heaven as a multitude of all nations and tribes and languages that no one can count if we are held captive to a structure that deems who is fully human and who is not? Mm. And so the church must speak out because the gospel is at stake. The advancement of the kingdom of God is at stake. There is a crippling of the good news when you remove the Imago Dei from a certain group that God created. And so um, it, the damage that it does to the mission of the church ought to propel the church to speak out. Mm. Do you mind if I say something to that? Please. Please. Well, um, it's also, it's damaging to their own soul. Hmm. Like the, the, the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us, 1 John 1, 9. And we will all give an account for what we say, what we do. And so it is, it's a detriment to our souls when we don't repent of um, sin of partiality, racial pride, whatever, however you want to categor, categorize it, it's hate against someone else. And, and God says, you, you, you can't love him and hate your brother. That's so, right. so I, I just want to, a call to repentance. There needs to be a repentance um, in our churches for them to thrive. And, and that, that's this, this is the call that the Bible, Jesus is calling us to. And, also, it's not living out the reality of what has been accomplished on the cross. So we know in Ephesians 2 that the veil of hostility has been torn in the body of Jesus Christ. We are united. That is the cosmic reality that has been accomplished, but we're not living it out. And so, so for us to see that reality, reality that we will one day experience, I, I really do believe it's um, confessing our sin and facing where we have wronged in this area. Um, and I, I really don't think that we can, al I almost think because I've been in about a thousand of these conversations and I'm glad to be here, but, <laughs> but I almost think we are, you had mentioned at the top of this, Roy, that, um, that there's something different about this the line of people who have died. There is something different, but in our history, we've kind of been here before. Mm. I mean, we, this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. And so how can, what can we do that we're not having this conversation in three, four months? I am, I am tired of this conversation, mm. not because I don't think it's important. I think it's incredibly important. We need to have this conversation. But I want to have the conversation that we're all made in the image of God and that we can love each other, that we can go and make disciples of all nations, that we will one day like a celebration. Mm. But we're constantly in a state, state of lament. Mm. It's a constant reality that we are in. And, and, and so my prayer and hope is that there would be true repentance, a true turning. And in the church, the church needs to be held to account. Mm. Um, and that 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 we will not be have we will not have this conversation again in a year, and that is my prayer, my hope, and that's my hope for the church. And I believe because Jesus says that our hope will not put us to shame. I believe that we can make more progress than we've made. I believe that I have hope for that. I do think we will not eradicate it. We will we can alleviate it. Right. And that my hope is is in Jesus in that future, but, but it is, uh, there needs to be repentance. Mm -hmm. All right, Tilly, I want to stay with you just for a second. 
Uh, you talked about the pro-life movement and uh, how vocal they've been about abortion, et cetera. Uh, but you talked about them encompassing the Ahmad Arbery murder. Um, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so the pro-life movement in general, there is a movement within the movement to be holistically pro-life. So from womb to tomb and not just the baby in the womb. Right. And so if this is to be accomplished, we have to recognize that when a black man is shot down, his life matters. And that therefore is a pro-life issue. And when we, if we can get on board and understand that all human beings may, we're all made in the image of God. We all have value. No one can take away that value because it's God given. Well, that, that is, it's, it's about life. And so I think um, the, the movement has been relegated to, and importantly so, to the womb, because we, we, we have a desire to see babies born. But I think the unfortunate reality is, is that we're not thinking about after they're born <laughs> or, or the, the person, we're just, we just don't think about those people who are walking and living. And, and, but there is a movement within that movement for that. And I'm grateful for that. So that is why um, it is a pro-life issue because it's a life that was taken um, unjustly, unjustly. <laughs> hey, that's good. And truly, I, I really want to appreciate you being with us. I know you're not feeling well. You might have to drop out a little bit. <laughs> Yes. We really, really appreciate your, your feedback and you stay as long as you can. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Hey, on that point, can I just offer this? Sure. Because um, Trey makes a, such a powerful point in it. And it's for me, I picture Jesus on that cross hmm. between two thieves, right? And think about it. Um, these are, in a sense, in that context, convicted criminals. And they are literally at the end of their lives. And Jesus, despite all the <coughs> and his passion, their lives matter. Mm -hmm. Even up until the last moment, you, you see the extent of his compassion. And Jesus is the head of the church. He is our chief example. And I think that just, I, I just want to really just add on to the point that, 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 that she makes, because how can we as the church not see those examples throughout everything that Jesus personified and the compassion that he shows and then walk day by day and see these things and it not occur to us that every single one of those lives matters. Mm -hmm. May I jump in there, my brother? Hey, jump on in. Because I don't think it's about the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to tell the truth. For over 30 years, I preached my heart out. And you know me and you know I have. Yeah. And I, I thought that if I would be biblical enough, if I would be theologically rigorous enough, if I would be non-confrontational or non-threatening. So I smiled a lot. I knew how to ingratiate myself in white circles so that people would listen to me and wouldn't think that I was an angry person who had an ax to grind or some hidden agenda that I was trying to bring in with me. I, I I gave it everything, not just some of myself. I gave my whole self. And when I realized that as a result of many things I've watched the white evangelical church do and not be clear biblically about how, how do you make the switch on that? How do you condone this? In what way do you justify that? One man said to me on Facebook, and I don't know this person, and so social media allows a person to have anonymity and say really harsh things. He said to me, and I quote, he was a white middle-aged white man. I don't know who he is, but he said, we liked you better when you just quoted Bible verses. Hmm. That's right. So what he was really saying is, oh, please tell me about Jesus. Cause see, I can take that. I can handle that. Do not bring up any issues like somebody being killed in the street because now you're being political and we don't like that. We like it when you just kill the Bible. We love how you preach. Oh, 
Oh my goodness, that's so prophetic. But do not connect that to real life. And that has something to do with white supremacy. That has something to do with power. And if we don't call a thing a thing, we'll keep going around in circles, in my opinion. So I don't think it's about the Bible. I don't think it is about Jesus. I think it's about seeing seeing things through a lens. And that lens is called whiteness. And I think we've got to interrogate that. More specifically, I think our white brothers and sisters in the evangelical church have got to do some truth telling about what they really think and believe about race. Mm. Brenda, I want to, oh, I was just going to say, you go, you go ahead, sis. Oh, go ahead. sorry. I was just going to say that I know um, white speakers who get that pushback constantly. I, I speak out about injustice all the time. No one says anything like that to me, but because I don't know if it's because I'm African American. You said it happens to you. So, but no one has said it to me. But all of my, all, uh, several of my white friends mm. who speak out about injustice get, why don't you just preach the Bible? Just, and, and so there is, there is a, I, I, I think there is a lack of desire to confront these issues, period. I do too. Yeah. So when you talk about abortion and caring about unborn lives and you talk about Flint, Michigan and children drinking lead poisoned water, it, it's a disconnect. People don't even know why we brought that up. And I am tired of not talking about what it's really about. So from this point forward, I am going to tell the truth as I understand it. And I believe that the Jesus that you talked about, my brother Thomas, is that there is indeed a Jesus who made the gospel relevant to the world in which he lived. And that's the work of the cross, I believe. And doing anything less, I think, is placating people to help them feel comfortable. Mm. That's right. From yeah, I mean, it denies that this is God's concern. The incarnation exposes injustice. As soon as God becomes flesh, poverty is exposed. The unjust systems of the Roman Empire and the killing of babies is exposed. Uh, issues of crossing the border and being a refugee are exposed. Systems and institutions that don't work for the blind and the paralyzed and diseased women are exposed. Uh, the, the, the ethnophobia of Samaritans is exposed. And so the incarnation uh, exposes injustice. The question is, will the American church join God? Mm. Mm. I think on this one, Roy, it, it's important because I want to yeah. make sure I'm clear in my stance because I, I, I stand firm on the perspective of this. I agree with everything that's been said and we don't, um, we haven't had as much of the conversation, but I, but I think it's both not only exposing it, which I fundamentally agree with it, I think it's actually, though, also pointing to the example that we all agree with in Jesus and what he modeled. So mm -hmm. my point is to the, the very thing that you say, Sister Brenda, Jesus was modeling real compassion. It wasn't a form of godliness. It was the real thing. It was. So we are actually saying the same thing. We're coming at it from a different perspective, because I think what, what you're effectively saying in a different way is there are people who present a form of godliness. Amen. Actually deny the power thereof. So so I'm not confused by any stroke of the imagination. And to be to put a finer point on it, racism as we're describing it at the root is just another form of sin. That's right. Right. That's right. And so we can't address the issue if we don't address the sin. That's right? right. And we and and by the way, if we're talking about the gospel, we can't address any sin if we're trying to make people feel comfortable. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's the hmm. opposite of conviction. <laughs> so I'm not confused by any stroke of the imagination of how we have to engage and what we have to call and what, what the truth is as it pertains to the sin of racism. Amen. Yes, Amen. yes. Okay. okay, all right. Any other feedback on that? I don't want to cut you off. All right, Shandra, I'm going to stay with you. You've had some uh, difficult experiences being pulled over, even had an experience at your house um, mm. with the police, and uh, it was difficult. Can you talk about those? Yeah, you know, um, 
It's tough because what I would say is, uh, I'll give this context, you know, um, and this ties to another point that Brenda was making. You realize when you go through life, whether it was uh, an incident, and I've had, you know, unfortunately too many um, events to um, point to, and it shouldn't be that way. But I think of, uh, you know, one event that I wrote an open letter about mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, pulled over, when I was just going out in the suburb on a date. Um, no infraction, uh, no anything. And, and at that moment, because I was confused about being pulled over, knowing I hadn't had an infraction, I went to um, actually get out of the car to speak to the officer to see what's going on. And the officer drew his weapon. I mean, you never forget those moments. Mm -hmm. um, but I can fast forward later. I, I'm sitting in the office in my home, in the home that I'm in, uh, where uh, there was an incident where we were getting threatening calls at our home. We couldn't figure out um, why this was going on. Um, but because they were leaving messages, I mean, we had the information and number. I, I, I called the police. I mean, that's the thing that you do. Right. And the police came to my house. Um, uh, they took down the information. They went outside and they actually called the individual, got the person on the phone. I was amazed because they came back into the house. The officer came back into the house and he says, well, this individual says you owe them money. They say they, uh, they now you'd have to be in my house. I live in a development that's new construction. He was explaining to me uh, while this person had put windows in my new construction home that I didn't pay them for. Um, and, I, and, and, and it was frustrating and I'm trying as calmly as I can. I said, listen, this is the messages that were left. I played them for you. I've told them what, they are literally threatening and I, I can't even repeat on this call the things that were saying. You have now contacted that person. I said, and so as I walked to him, I said, you have to help me understand because I have a family. I have two, two children. I have two sons and my wife. And I'm concerned because if they really act on what they're saying, and as I walked towards the police officer in my home, he drew his weapon. Mm. Oh now, God. here's the thing. What occurred to me is it didn't matter what the context was. It doesn't matter if I was uh, a young adult going on a date if I was in a relatively affluent suburb as a father and an executive of a corporation and an elder and associate pastor in my church, it doesn't matter because in any of the instances, they are conditioned, not all, but many, to see me as a threat. And so that speaks to some of the issue that we talk about. And so when people say, what do you mean when you talk about the, the institutionalization of racism? That's right. What do, you talk, what do you mean when you talk about the, the persistence of racist ideas that people in some ways know they have and in other ways don't even realize that they have? Why would I, as an unarmed person calling the police for help, be a threat to the police officer that I call? And why is it in that event, and, and this is the unfortunate reality for me, and I'll end here, Roy, that event ended and they never pursued the person that was making the assaulting or threatening phone calls. And so the net result is I was put most at risk. And so the one place that you would hope to be safe, the one place that you think that you would be safe, right, I was not safe. I still think to this day and the thing that bothers me, and I know uh, it's the grace of God over my life, but to think that I actually could have been killed in my own home in front of my wife and my family or calling the police, right, who are charged to protect and serve me. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. That's powerful, bro. And Can I say something to that, Roy? Please. I was just thinking, I have seen um, a few. Thank you for sharing that story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have seen people, and he listed um, the reasons, some of the reasons why he shouldn't be shot. Like, it didn't matter if he was an executive. It didn't matter if he was a pastor. And I saw a video of a um, black man with dreads, and he named, you saw that video? Okay, so he 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 was talking and, and slowly, and, and explaining all of the reasons, uh, to, like he was trying to say, well, get to know me before you judge me. And what I'd love to see is us not have to do that. That that we don't need to have to explain who, all of our accolades or, and of course that's not what you were doing there, but, but explain why we should be valued. We should just be valued because we're people. And, and that's one of the things that has been frustrating, I think, um, over the last 
couple of weeks that I've seen over and over and over again is people feeling kind of the need to prove that they are worthy, but we are already worthy because God has made us worthy. And so it is a, obviously that's not the reality that we live in. And that's the reason for this. That's not our reality, but it is the desire that I, I just, someone asked me if I, um, felt like I needed to, is there, I can't remember what the question was exactly, but I, I told them that I no longer feel the need to have to explain myself, explain or answer all the questions. I state what I believe through conviction and then I leave it rather than continually needing to explain. So I just want to, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's what all of us have already been saying that there is a deep rooted, um, a sin problem and a white supremacy problem. And we've, we've explained all of those. Um, but I also, I just think we, we just have to get to the point in our society where we don't have to explain. Mm. Who we, we, don't, we don't need to look a certain way. Um, Brenda was talking about how she would go in white spaces and smile and mm -hmm. like, we don't need to, we, I just hate it that we always feel like we have to prove our worth or prove our- It's difficult. It, yeah, so so that is something that I that burdens me for the church, is that we just shouldn't for the church in particular for our society absolutely, but for the church in particular, we we just we have to put it into that. Um, yeah. Okay. The statement is: We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. I heard Ron Carpenter say something uh, recently. He said the system is not is uh, is not broken. It was designed the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Give me some feedback on that. Is that true? Uh, in what ways are systemic racism alive and well? Uh, Reverend Brenda, can we start off with you? Sure. Um, I I'm still moved by our brother's story. Yeah. Because and it's not a story. This is his life. This is what happened. And so um, I guess I get moved so deeply because the very real possibility that he could not be here is we're sitting with that reality. And that is um, not just it is sin, but I want to call it evil. Mm. I want to say that it's evil. Um that a person can't call the police and 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 not be afraid that maybe the person who called for help will actually become the victim of of having called to be helped by someone who sees them as the threat it, it, Tamir Rice within seconds was shot this 11 year old boy he didn't even have a chance to prove that he was a nice kid because you know, those things happen so quickly that the person doesn't have a chance to for you to get to know me, you know? And so I want to, and, and I think if I could be so candid and honest, and again, to know me is to know that I don't have an ax to grind. I love God. Um, I literally love God. I grew up in a small Pentecostal church that they, they love God 24 seven. And they taught me to love God with all my heart every day. So I'm not perfect, but I'm not kidding around about loving my loving God. So I'll say this comes out of my heart that um, diversity, I think we're confusing diversity with um, with race. God created diversity mm -hmm. and it is good. The, the cultural differences that make up human beings, the diversity in nature, that is a, a reflection of the multifaceted nature of God. And it is good. Race was created by human beings for one very clear purpose, which was to do what we've already identified, to dehumanize certain people and put other people on top of them. And so that system that came out of that concept called race is evil. God has nothing to do with that. And so 
I would say that one of the things we have not, we've got to stop doing is conflating being uh, about caring about racial reconciliation and making that the same as making friends with people. I think people who are now saying that the system is a racist system and that's not the same as going to a multicultural or diverse church or having a multicultural campus, that there's two different things happening. One was made by God, diversity is good, race is made by human beings and it is evil. And I think we've got to call it that. So I think we have to change our language because the system that is broken or not broken, the system that was created, that is working exactly the way it was designed to work was built on that concept, that evil concept called race. And everything that has come since then, what's happened to Native Americans, the Japanese internment, the Chinese Exclusion Act, how Jews were treated in this country, how children are being separated from their parents at the border. Even now, that stuff is evil. And I think that I want to call the church, if this had to be the last thing I had to say, tell the truth. Mm. I think we have to stop making believe that this is all about how we all need to come together. No, I think that there's certain work that certain certain different facets of the church has got to do. And I think our white brothers and sisters have got to tell the truth about what has been evil in our country so that God can heal us of it, help heal us as a collective of it. I think we've got to reclaim our narrative and our story as people of color. I think there needs to be conversations between Africans and African-Americans that have been distorted in our understanding of each other, that we might heal our connection. But I don't think that we we should continue to say that we all have been doing the same thing, because I think people of color have been trying to tell the truth for a very long time. And I think that there has been a resistance to hear the truth and to name the truth among white evangelicals who want to believe that this is about knowing each other better. And I think it's about naming the evil that has created a system that's killing people. Mm, mm. And, you know, this isn't the first time mm. that human beings have created idolatrous, oppressive, sinful systems. It's in the Bible, the Tower of Babel. I hope I don't get in trouble with God for what I'm about to say, but I wish the same way that God dismantled the Tower of Babel before it had an opportunity to have any kind of impact, God would have done the same thing with the race system. Mm. I hope God's not mad at me for saying that. I wish, I wish God, just like he stepped in and thwarted the strategy of the power of Babel, I wish he would have stepped in. But what I had to learn is sometimes God allows the system and the beast behind the system to reign for what seems like forever to us but just a little while to God. And I know that in the end, Jesus comes and destroys the system and the beast, the serpent, the dragon behind the system. But until then, Christians ought to be giving a sneak preview of what it looks like when the beast is defeated. Mm. The church thriving and flourishing, unfortunately has participated in expanding the systems instead of chipping away at it. And so that's why when we talk about evangelicalism and its participation, and we get in trouble for even naming that truth, mm -hmm. that documented historical truth, you get in trouble because the church doesn't want to admit that before Revelation gets to the defeating of the beast, it describes the compromising of the seven churches. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at uh, how the church has been complicit and how the church has compromised in its most dominant, powerful form mm -hmm. so that we can acknowledge how sinister these systems are. I agree. Roy, Roy if I, if I, 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 when I think about the, the quote that you made from Ron Carpenter, um, and so first of all, let me, obviously, you know, from my first comment, how I felt about the construct of race. So I'm not going to add anything to the great uh, articulation that was there. But where the issue is, because, you know, we have to then now fight the, the system that's been put in place. And, and where, what he said was, was, was so, so insightful, because let's give an example. Think about the criminal justice system. It's designed to produce exactly what it does. 
And so if we think about the unfortunate results of it, we have African Americans who make up thir- you know, roughly 13 or 14 percent of the population. You know, it's the same percentage of drug use in the African American of the overall population, 13 percent. But we account for 36 percent of the arrests that are related to to drugs, and we account for 46 percent of the convictions. So mm-hmm. how can it be? It means that the system, right, is inherently inequitable. Think about the public school system. This is interesting. I live in the state of Illinois, and the public school system. What they say is. It's an equitable system. If you look on the records, it says everybody has to go to school for the same number of days. It's true. On average, in the state of Illinois, it's 174 days. Doesn't matter if you're in the inner city or in a fluent suburb, if you're in a public school. But what's different is the amount of hours spent in instruction are dramatically different. They can be as much as 30, 35% different if you're in an affluent suburb, public school, or if you're in the inner city. Now, think about the cumulative benefit of that learning over time, right? And so if we start looking at those things, think about even in companies that we work for. There was this great research that was done by the University of Chicago years ago, why Jamal can't get a job. And they literally took resumes and they changed the names. And so what they showed is people with ethnically sounding names were significantly less likely to even get called in for the actual interview, though they had the same qualifications. So when he says that the system is not broken, it's designed that way, this is what the system is producing. And I think so um, to the points, to to impart the points that were made earlier, we've got to stop accepting the construct as it is. Mm -hmm. We, 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 and and then there's a a broader point to be made, we may get to is, I, I think that in addition to what I agree, what we talk about in terms of the power structure and what affects the, you know, uh, the, the, the white community, we also have to deal with the racist ideas that have pervaded all communities. Because the part that, that, that we need to actually lay bare as we tell the truth is for our people, for people of African descent, how little often we know about our own history. That's right. Right? And that actually exposes us more to the lies that are often perpetuated through racist ideas, right? And so I I think there's another part of the dialogue to unearth. You know, can I just add to Sean John, I'm so glad that you got real specific. That was incredibly helpful because I think when when people hear the word systemic injustice or systems, they have no idea what what really we're talking about. So thinking about police, putting a context to it and and giving some statistics and schooling. I, I was thinking about gerrymandering and uh, food deserts and thinking about, yeah, yeah, people can't get food in the United States. And so so I think these, we need to, in order for us to really affect change, think real specifically and get, be, call out what it is that's actually broken rather than just calling out the term because I think it, it it's hard to um, take action if we're just talking about the term. And then Also think about policies. Um, I was in a meeting recently and a a good friend of mine made a list of all the different policies he wanted to, we were speaking to a government official and he made a list of all the different policies that he wanted to see change in his context. And and that to me um, put feet on, on, okay, how can we, change the system. So so I think um, when we're having this conversation and this is, it's not beyond the church where people, we're, we are in the public square, we're people who are supposed to be involved in in the world, not of the world. So, so we need to think about these policies that are um, established and be active in our communities. I think that's how we're going to really help make a change in this system. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Hey, if you're you're watching now and you're saying, man, I'm enjoying this and I have a question, now is the time for you to submit your question. We've got to wrap up in about 10 minutes. So uh, submit your question and uh, the team will be glad to uh, stick around and talk to you a little bit. They really will. All right, so let me read a quote, you guys. And then I, I want to go back to something that Sean John just said just a second ago. I just want to unpack that and uh, it's time is getting away from us. All right, so I'm reading a quote today from Christianity Today. And they use a metaphor from Wendy Doniger. It says, 
Two explorers enter a cave filled with the most elaborate spider webs. One of them cannot locate a spider and thus refuses to believe it exists. The other guy says, you see the webs, the spider is implied. I, I like that quote mm -hmm. because for some people, they can't figure it out. You should just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, you have every opportunity that we have. I mean, what's what's <laughs> what's your problem? <laughs> You're a bunch of whiners. That's all you are. Just 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 get it done. Um, to that, you say what? Anybody? I think that's why I've said the word, um, and, and it sounds like I'm hammering on this whole notion of white evangelicals, and it's not because I have any particular um, anything in my heart other than wanting to say, I think we've got to ask, what 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 aren't we talking about? Who doesn't see the spider web? Mm -hmm. You know, who's not naming the spider web? Because to make it a general statement as if we don't see the spider web, you know, I wrote an article recently and um, an op-ed and in it, I said that we've not been telling the truth in the United States. And then I had to go back and, and rewrite it. And I got scared. I'm not trying to raise trouble, but I had to say, no, it's not true that we've not been telling the truth. Chandron, you've been telling the truth, haven't you? <laughs> Trillia and Ephraim and Roy, you've been telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So I had to say to myself, it's not true. We, who's we? Who, who's the we who don't see the spider web? <laughs> we, we have to say who we're really talking about in order for us to decide who's got to address what. You, you see what I'm saying? And so I would just start this conversation off by saying it hurts me to have to be so clear to say, I think that people of color have been saying for some time, there's a spider here and that spider is a poisonous spider. And it's and, and, and other people are saying, well, I don't see a spider. And we're trying to say, but all of this web that Chandran just explained <laughs> systemically is all the evidence of the spider. And so my hope is that one, people would believe that what we're saying is accurate, but I'm almost tired of having to keep trying to cajole white America to believe me. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do about this spider. And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm saying to white America, if you would allow uh, us to to be to to lead here and trust that what we're saying, because ultimately this spider is dangerous for everybody, and it is not just something that's hurting us. This has the potential eventually to hurt you as well. And so I think that it would be very very helpful for those who keep saying they don't see the spider. You may not, but trust us when we tell you that it's there. And then let's start talking about then what has to happen in order to deal with this threat that is present and has left evidence that it's that it's there. Yeah. Okay, the crowd is, is saying Black Lives Matter. The crowd is saying no justice, no peace. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen this kind of fervor before. Black, white, marching together. I, I want I want to, um, I don't know, do, I, I don't want to say reality check, but I, I, I want to check in with you guys. Uh, do you feel like this is different than um, other situations? Are you hopeful or do you feel like eventually this will fizzle? Somebody talk to me. Yeah, so I kind of started with this, didn't I? I, I, I am hopeful, mm. but cautious, because we have seen, think of the civil rights movement. They were marching together, black and white. So this isn't actually anything new, but I think for our day and age, I, I think, okay, we are there. There's a movement. I mean, NASCAR just said that they, they wouldn't allow the Confederate flag in their stadiums. So that's a big deal. That's yeah. a big deal. So I am very hopeful, but I'm mostly hopeful in Jesus. So that is where I place my hope, not in the people or not in what, what I see right now. In about four weeks, my hope and prayer is that we're, we're, we see a movement, kind of like what Chandran, that there is an actual action taking place and not just words. And so I am, I'm hopeful, but cautious. Okay. Someone else. Yeah. So again, I, I like the comment that was made because it's not new to print this point. You know what I would say? Hmm. We have had truth tellers throughout time, you know, the, the, the prophets of, 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 of their time and season, so to speak. I would say this though. I, I think we also have to acknowledge there are many people who have been silent, uh, including folks in our community. 
So I have hope on a number of levels, but you know, one of the things that actually gives me a lot of hope that I see people finding their voice mm -hmm. in all communities. But the thing that's most encouraging to me is people that I see in our community finding their voice, people that weren't showing that courageous to speak up, that courage to speak up in their work environment mm -hmm. or to have that crucial conversation or that uncomfortable conversation. Sure. You're seeing that happen. Um, you're seeing people on social media, in a sense, it's, it's, it's their, their revealing experience and thoughts and the ways. And I think there's something about that that's powerful and lasting because that's a freedom um, that you can have in your own mind and your life. I think that will unlock some of the things that we've been referring to and Brenda was referring to about people really understanding who they are who they are, not just in terms of the wonderful uh, people that God has made all of us, including all of our ethnicity and our culture and all those things, but also who they are in Christ. Mm. All right. Hey, Pastor, I want, I want to ask you this. Um, are there any concrete steps that folks can take? I, I mean, let's face it, there have been some difficult conversations. There's been some awkward moments. Uh, people feel like, I don't know what to say. I don't want to set you off. I don't want you to snap out on me. Um, what kind of concrete steps can folks take? And I realize your answer doesn't have to be all encompassing, uh, but at least start us down the road. And I'll ask you guys as well. Uh, Pastor, what, what, what can we do? Uh, well, proximity. Close the gap between yourself and the stories and the experiences that you're not sure that you believe, that you haven't owned. And so, because I think that's, we have, we have to join God in closing the distance between those that are caught in systems uh, that weren't built for them in the first place, which, was, which, which we've already established. You know, you know, pull yourself back from cable news, pull yourself back from um, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. She would say this on her own, but I'm, I'm just going to steal, you know, one of her models in, in her book, Roadmap to Reconciliation. We're at a catalytic moment mm -hmm. and you have a choice to make. You can choose transformation or you can choose preservation. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to have proximity, to, to get close, to get near with people that you're commenting on, but you don't know, I believe that that will get you down the road of transformation versus uh, being stuck in preservation. Mm. Okay, Brenda. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. Um, thank you for that shout out, my brother Ephraim. Um, I think I've I've come to be a little bit more clear about what I mean about reconciliation. So I too am growing in my clarity because I would I would say at one point that what the next steps are for people to actively work for reconciliation, but that's too vague. So I would say it it is repairing broken systems together with people whose lives are being negatively impacted by those systems. So repairing broken systems means that in the various places where people are listening to this conversation, if we want to start to actually be a part of the solution, we start asking ourselves, what's broken? What's keeping people from reaching their full God-given potential here? And if that was my son or my daughter, if that situation happened to someone I know and love, what would I want to happen so that I would never have to be afraid that this man could call the police because of a threatening phone call and he himself be put in a part, place of danger? What would have to change? What system is, is allowing that to become an ongoing reality? And then together, let's work on doing something about that particular system. So I think that those of us who are called to the work of reconciliation, the Bible says that we are called to be repairers of the breach. Amen. Look for the places that are broken, and then we are supposed to be a part of helping to repair that. So the voting system, people are being disenfranchised the vote. How do we do something to repair that? You know, we've already named the, the public school system and the inequity in it. What do we do to repair that so that all children are actually being educated? That's the kind of work I think that this time is requiring of us. Hmm. All right, Trillia, you've got a 
any points you want to make concerning making a concrete uh, change or any concrete steps that folks can take? You got any ideas for us, Trillia? Um, well, I, I, I still am stuck on the first thing I said. I really think that there needs to be repentance. I just don't think without conviction and repentance and awareness of our, our sin, where we have faltered, we need to start with ourselves and asking our hearts some questions and facing, I, I think we've said this, face ourselves. And so, and so I believe that is a lot of, all of our first step is, is really to look in the mirror and ask, are we willing to change? We are going to give an account and God invites us to repent. And so that to me is, is a biblical clear first step. But I really just don't know how we can um, reconcile, how we can join together and do these things without some dissecting and transformation in our hearts. It's a hard thing. Chandra, I'm going to let you uh, wrap us up. Concrete steps that people can take on this journey. Yeah. So, so first of all, um, with this thought of um, building up what's broken, there are some very specific areas. At the top of my list is uh, the criminal justice system. Um, if you think about the impact that that has, we've taken Black men out of our communities at the most productive point of their lives. That means everything to from economic vitality to safety in the communities or whatever. Um, let's let's go at real criminal justice reform. Mm. Um, let's let's. I mean, we. I can't believe in this country we've we've legalized uh, the use of marijuana in many places, and we have people in prison uh, for petty possession of it. So 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 there are some concrete, immediate things that we can do, including eradicating those records that would begin to meaningfully change and impact communities. Uh, if we think about, again, uh, other broken parts of the systems, clearly we know that there's a dramatic difference in uh, the educational system. I mean, and it's been, been that way since we uh, instilled or reinforced things like equal uh, but separate, and we know that's not true. Okay. It's unequal and separate. Oh, and so right. we know that there are things that we can go at. So those are the systemic things that are broken. And here's what I would say. It, 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 I would love to see it and see it more start with the church, but if we people of different backgrounds come together and say we are actually part of one community, the human community. And so I just gave a couple of examples, but we're going to go build those things together. And we're going to, as we do that, build intimate relationships. And we're going to get to know one another because it's hard for me to hate you if I really know you, mm. right? Um, and, and, and at the end of that, there are two things I would say to um, my, my, my wonderful brothers and sisters of African descent. Uh, it's two things. We just have more work to get to know ourselves, our true selves and our true history, and more work, and I really love Trilla's comments, to know God, know him completely and fully for ourselves, because that's whose image and likeness we are made in. And because of that, when I know that, when I'm confident in that, no concept of race can confuse me about who I am and who I belong to. Yeah. And that's so important for all the things that we have to face because there will be continue to be some hard days on this. Um, but thank you all. I, I, I'm really encouraged by this dialogue. I love you all as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you so much for letting me participate. This has been a wonderful time of interaction. This this hour flew by. I didn't didn't think it would uh, encompass all that I wanted to accomplish, and I'm sure you all had some more to say. But uh, thank you so much for being a part of it. I guess I just want to close by saying this: I've seen so many images on TV, certainly some that are horribly tragic, uh, and yet some that are inspiring. Um, of course, tragic is the scene with uh, George Floyd with a white police officer's knee on his neck, uh, inspiring seeing protesters hugging the police, the police hugging protesters, police taking a knee, hearing officers say, this was ridiculous, this was evil, this should not have happened. I think that kind of dialogue, that kind of connection is the start of connecting. I, I wanna end with the scripture that Trillia and many of you have utilized tonight that says, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Uh, God says, I'll forgive the sin, I'll heal the land. Come on, let's pray together. 
let's talk together. As Pastor has said, let's be in proximity together. I believe together we're better. And so thank you again so much for tuning in and watching. And uh, there's books by these folks and uh, I hope that you check them out. And I'm sure Tommy Lee, thank you, Tommy and Resource Global for this. I'm sure those books and resources will be listed. I turn it over to Tommy Lee at this time. Roy, thank you very much for just your friendship and uh, just for mo moderating this conversation as well too. Hey, I just want to apologize for all those who saw that Facebook comment that appeared on the screen. We actually had to end up blocking the user. So thank you so much for your patience on that one. Hey, one question I did want to ask the panel, Roy, including you as well too. Would any one of you guys care to comment or give your thoughts on Candace Owen and what she says? One person asks is, how do we respond to someone like Candace Owen? And how, how do we process what she's saying? Any of you guys would like to comment on that one? What is she saying? Or what is she saying? I'll just comment on this point. So the judge of Miss Owen, is that uh, black people are the only people that make heroes out of criminals. And we're the only race of people on the planet that um, protest and launch movements uh, off of uh, the deaths of criminals. <laughs> Man, you know, I, I so I will just say this, and, and then I'm going to let my sisters and my brothers take it a little deeper. So one is, we're not making heroes out of unarmed Black people that have died at the hands of law enforcement or vigilantes. We're exposing the horror of the ways that they died. We're exposing the hypocrisy that you can go into a black church during Bible study and kill people and get Burger King before you're interrogated. That you can go into a school in Florida and kill people and while you're armed, somehow you can be arrested and get your day in court. We're exposing the hypocrisy that armed people were in government buildings in Michigan spitting on police officers. And unarmed black people, um, that they, they don't get their day in court if, they does, if, if that's what's supposed to happen. So nobody's lionizing. George Floyd or Sandra Bland or Breonna Taylor or Tamir Rice. We're, we're not building idolatrous idols in their name. We are shocked, broken, traumatized, grieving by a cycle that continues because the full humanity of Black people is not recognized. The, your life record doesn't suspend you from being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have to, that that's brought up by somebody who looks like the person that died is sad to me. I, can I say something real pointed, Tommy, just to my, this is to my white brothers and sisters. Do not resist the temptation to find the one African-American who confirms what you think mm. and then share it with us <laughs> for a number of reasons. One, we already know, um, but also it's generally the minority view. And really it's just, it's not a, a way to grow or learn. It's just finding someone who thinks like you and, and then sharing it with us. I get that, I've gotten that a lot. Like, what about Candace Owens? And I'm like, so I just, <laughs> I, I just, I'm, I, and I say that out of love. I think we just want to, to not try to confirm our, our bias or what, our, what we think by using another person who looks like me or anyone on this call. So, so I would just 
resist that temptation and 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 diversify who you're listening to. I, I think that has um, I've recently had a conversation about so, someone who listens to Ben Shapiro. I think that, that's his name and Candace Owens. And I gave her a list of a whole bunch of other people that she can be listening to, because I do think that um, the loudest often win the ear. And and um, I just yeah. So so I hope that that is received in the the way that it I, I it's really out of a love and care for your soul but also to protect my other brothers and sisters of color that we don't we don't want to do that to each other so yeah i, I would just reiterate tommy a point i shared earlier that se separating racism from racist ideas mm -hmm. racist ideas are not bound by the person's ethnicity skin color so i have met people of every walk of life, of every quote unquote color, ethnicity, et cetera, who have racist ideas. And so when I hear that, what, what it just encourages me is to, 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 to get everybody to pause and think and say, what have I consumed, right? From this made up concept of race that now has influenced the way that I look at one of God's creations and my prayer is that every day, because we all only know in part, that God will reveal to me that the, the, the power of the spirit that, that can tear us under, right? You know, my own interest and self-interest from that which is really true and which is really spiritual uh, can divide us under the thoughts and the intentions of the heart will help us in these matters. Because again, like I said, those racist ideas are not limited uh, to any particular person and any particular persuasion. Hey, let me ask you another question. Roy, Trillia, Brenda, you guys work in a Bible University, Bible School at Moody and SPU. And Ephraim, you're a pastor. Chandra, you also work with your father as a pastor on the weekends. What do you want the American churches to do besides preaching a sermon, doing a Bible study, and doing a couple of niches in the next couple of weeks? What do you want pastors and churches to actually tangibly be doing? And also, what do you want to see seminaries do to continue to train and educate their pastors? Roy, let me just start with you. Oh, actually, I've got to go. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, if I, Roy, do you mind if I just, okay. <laughs> and, and everyone, thank you for being here. I'm sorry I have to leave. I, I would just say um, to, I, I can't think of the scripture in Micah 6, 8, I believe do justice, walk humbly. So um, one of the things that I am grateful for with my pastor is we started a farm to help with that food, that the food deserts in our area. So we have a farm where we just go and, and then we can deliver food. So we can actually be, and this is kind of a cliche, but the hands of feet of Jesus. So I, I think going out and actually that's, that's one way I, I think you can help with the systemic issues that we were talking about. Be involved in your community, go to those community um, uh, meetings, vote, um, speak up. I, so I, I think there are some real practical things that we can do beyond just uh, the Sunday sermon. And so, and so I, when we really want to, if we really want to take our faith, we need to take our faith and put it into action. So that would be my call and encouragement to any church, um, any person walking um, who claims Jesus, who professes faith in Christ, is to actually take your faith and put it in action and to do the work of ministry in this broken world. Hey guys, thank you so much. It has been an absolute blast to just learn from each of you. I respect and and it's just been an honor. And I'm sorry, I have to run. It's just gone long. So <laughs> appreciate you. I, I just thank you, Julia, so much for being with us. Uh, I, I would ask that um, that the white church would um, talk, have conversations, listen, um, and listen more than you talk. By the way, um, there, there's a phrase on on uh, on the internet that says, "If you're waiting for me to answer the question." the way you want me to answer it, um, you might be waiting a long time. Let me tell the truth or keep moving down the line until you can find Candace or whoever else you want to talk to. Listen, 
listen, listen, listen, talk with me. Then I want you to walk with me. Um, there's a story about uh, one of these apologists, Josh McDowell. He was um, going to a, um, a motel with one of his fellow workers, you know, and uh, so they were about to go into to a, a motel and the motel owner said, uh, you can't stay here because you're black. And Josh couldn't believe that. And so he goes inside. He says, wait a minute. Um, I, I want to stay here. My friend needs to stay. He said, you can stay. He cannot stay. Well, I won't stay if he won't stay. And if you all know Josh at all, he's a fiery guy. And so he walked out in a huff. He, he probably said some things, too, on his way out. And they kept driving down the road. I love the fact that he didn't stay in a situation that would have been convenient for him. So, so talk with me, walk with me, pray with me, and stay with me. Uh, just because the going gets rough doesn't mean that you need to uh, bug out. Um, it, this this is like marriage, uh, sometimes even more than that. Just because the going gets a little tough, uh, stay connected. Don't divorce yourself from me because either you don't see it the way I see it or because your friends stop hanging out with you like they used to. I'll jump in. Yeah, I'll just jump in to say that there are two different books that I would highly recommend, particularly as we're thinking about the um, the do dominant culture, white dominant culture church, because I know eventually this conversation will be heard, or heard around the world. And so we are exporting our ideas from the dominant culture here in the United States as we share the gospel. It's being also um, um, polluted, if you will, by an ideology that's not just scriptural. And so we've got to clarify what has been, been nationalism and cultural stuff that has been from the United States and what's actual scriptural. So there's a book that's just come out by David Swanson called Rediscipling the White Church. I would highly recommend it. There's another a book by Daniel Hill called White Awake. And I think that that's a conversation that the white dominant culture church needs to begin to have. So I would say, do your work. Um, making a friend, uh, washing feet, taking me out to dinner, coffee, or asking me questions. I'm tired. I've got my own work to do. I think for people of color, we need to decenter, always trying to get white people to change and start asking ourselves, what's a new narrative for us? What are some of the things that we can begin to work on and, and, and collaborate around across the various uh, areas of people of the diaspora together? How can Africa? Caribbean people and African-American people come together and begin to solve some of the problems we face? How can we get a narrative, as I think my brother has said, that's not just a narrative of what we've been told about ourselves here in the United States. So there's work for us to do, but there's also work for the white dominant culture church to do. And I think beginning to have those conversations around how do we get discipled into thinking that Jesus and all this other stuff actually comes together? Where did that happen and how can we deconstruct what is actually a very, very, um, uh, it's a hard word, for, I don't know, but it's a distorted understanding of the gospel. How can we deconstruct that? And that would be my call to the church. And in the meantime, I'd say, say something. Uh, this week when things are happening and people are in the street and you say absolutely nothing, your silence is deafening. So for all churches, regardless of denominations, regardless of where we are around the world, at least have a prayer of lament in your church for it, but don't act like it's not happening. Got it. And with that said, Dr. Salter McNeil, Roy Patterson, Ephraim Smith, Shundran Thomas, thank you so much. The hour and 15 minutes went by so fast. So Thank you for taking time out to talk and special thanks for Trillia, who was not feeling well, but was able to have enough strength to join us for uh, the majority of the time as well, too. And so, hey, I also want to thank you, our partners, Renew Chicago, part of Park Community Church in Chicago, Navigators, Mission Create, InterVarsity, uh, their MBA ministry, Resource Global, Wheaton College's Center for Faith and Innovation, and Together LA for making this conversation possible and allowing these wonderful friends and ministry leaders and marketplace leaders to engage on that. And so Roy, I actually am gonna actually ask you to pray and wrap us up as we wrap up the evening. All right, again, Tommy Lee, thank you so much. Resource Global, thank you so much for your support and pulling us all together. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for the wisdom that we've heard tonight, the insights and we're just praying, God, that you use something with it. 
Uh, your word was quoted tonight. Don't let it return to you void. We just believe that um, you're able to bring on a change. And most of us on this particular call, we're tired. Uh, we're tired of talking about this. We're tired of seeing this. We're tired of the frustration of trying to explain our pain. Will you renew our strength? Will you cause us to mount up with wings as eagles, to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint? And will you cause some people to hold our arms up, to strengthen us, to uh, stand with us, to uh, stand against the power, the evil that's been spoken of tonight? We love you. We trust you. And we want to thank you that we've come this far by faith, leaning on you. We commit ourselves to you. Help us to walk hand in hand, having a love that goes from heart to heart and breast to breast. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a good night, everyone.